worked with Chris Sadowski over the summer. Big shout out to him. He put up with a lot. Um, so obviously I didn't quite accomplish everything I wanted to over the summer. I think that's pretty typical, but uh, I'm still proud of what I did. And uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it right here. Um, my research was more into pure mathematics as opposed to applied mathematics, which were the last two things that you heard about applied statistics and uh, use of differential equations to solve metabolic processes. Uh, so what I, what I looked into, uh, actually let's do this first. Why do we do research into pure mathematics? Um, obviously there are applications later on, such as we have just heard about and continue to hear about in further presentations. Um, it's really cool and objectively true of like literally everything else. Uh, I've seen a lot of funny comics in which like teachers have to cope with the fact that everything they're teaching may not be objectively true. But that's not something we can say about mathematics simply because everything we do is true by definition. We, we, we say some things are true and then find out what that implies about everything else. Uh, and my last point, I only put this slide in so you wouldn't ask me about this stuff later. Um, for some reason, everyone who does pure mathematics research, or really any science research, has to have some end goal, something that they're going to produce, something that they're going to help society which is not true about literature or history or anything like that. It's okay that they have no application. They're just kind of talking about. I don't mean to offend anyone. I'm not saying that they're not good <laughs> academic pursuits. <laughs> this is equally a good <laughs> academic pursuit. <laughs> Next slide. Unfortunately, Next slide. I have to be talking for six or <laughs> slides. Yeah. Uh, preliminary concepts of terminology. Uh, the first of many slides as such. The specific field that I worked in was abstract algebra. It takes things that we know about, such as real numbers, natural numbers, integers, basically things that you're very familiar with, one, two, three, four, et cetera, fractions thereof, and decimals. And we want to use what we know about that to talk about other more complicated structures, such as lattices, algebras, groups. And we group all these different things that we know about, the things that we want to learn about, into uh, specific uh, fields, not a great word because field has different meaning than what I'm talking about, but by grouping these things, and again, grouping is again ironic, uh, we're able to learn specific things once and then apply it to many other things. And that's, that's what abstract algebra is, does, and continues to be interesting for. Uh, if you thought this slideshow was going to be pretty, you're wrong, and I'm wondering why you think a math slideshow should ever be pretty. Um, again, I told you there would be more preliminary concepts and terminology. Uh, the stuff that I looked at was lattices and their central extensions, as you saw on the first slide. Uh, a brief introduction, a lattice is just, um, it's a freely generated abelian group, but for some of you I don't think that means very much. Basically, if we think about um, Cartesian coordinates, uh, you have the x-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis, and you think about using uh, basic base, base vectors, like x hat, y hat, z hat. Um, you're basically taking any point in that Cartesian space and representing it as the sum of a certain number of x hat, a certain number of y hat, a certain number of z hat. And we say that's a freely uh, generated abelian group because you have these base vectors, x hat, y hat, z hat, and you're just adding them together in different ways to get the different elements in that structure. And a lattice is just generalizing that. So we're saying we can have any number of these generators, and we can have, um, and we're not giving them names, x hat, y hat, z hat, we're, saying, we're calling them alpha sub i for some, so for any number, we have a different generator. And uh, we, we looked at, um, finite lattices, so they, were, they had a finite number of generators. Uh, we said it was n number of generators. Uh, what is a central extension? A central extension takes this lattice that we know something about. Oh, hey, thanks for showing up. Uh, it has a certain number of dimensions, and then we want to extend it, so we're saying that this lattice has a, a little bit more in one more dimension. It's, it's a fixed number, though. It, we can't have any number of that uh, direction, but we can have a, a small number. The, the group that we extended by was the uh, group generated by negative 1, so it has two elements, negative 1 and 1. And so for any uh, element in this central extension, you had uh, 
the lattice section, section, segment, in which you have the sum of your generators, and then you have either negative one or one. Uh, a co-cycle is something we need in order to retain associativity with our central extension. The central extension is actually a semi-direct product of the lattice and the group which is extending it. So the way that they interact is determined both by adding up the lattice elements, as you would normally do, or uh, a dot product, so you're going to be multiplying them in certain ways. Um, and we're also going to have an interaction that the central extension group has on the lattice. So let's say if we have negative one and something else with a freely generated abelian group, we're going to multiply that negative one to everything else, so it's going to be negative, whatever it was beforehand. And so the, the way in which they interact requires that we have a co-cycle, uh, which is basically what I just talked about. <sighs> the problem with pure mathematics is that there's a lot of terminology that you have to go through before you can actually say anything. Um, an automorphism is a fancy term for something that's not very fancy. Um, we're basically taking any element from our lattice and sending it to a different element, a different point. So if we have the point 1, 0, 0, we're going to send that to 0, 1, 0. And the automorphism says that uh, every point is sent to exactly one other point, and no two points are sent to the same point. An isometry um, uh, is an automorphism that uh, conserves the relation among points. So that if, if like 1, 0, 0 times 1, 1, 0 is just going to give you your dot product, that's going to give you 1, then after you apply the isometry, say you rotate it, uh, you're still going to get 1 back from your inner product, from your dot product. And I'll seriously stop reading my third point, so it don't mean anything. Um, shout out to my advisor, he put up with a lot over the summer. Um, he was trying to get a grant proposal done, and he put up with my procrastination, and uh, <coughs> we both drank a lot of coffee. Previous work motivating this research. Uh, the research that I worked on and extended was the re research of Chris Sadowski and Michael Penn. They looked at specific lattices um, corresponding to Dinkin diagrams, which tells you how the different generators in the lattice interact with each other under a co-cycle. Um, we looked at uh, DN and AN type lattices, uh, which basically tells you how the co-cycle works for the lattices that we were talking about. For an AN um, type lattice, we have an even number of uh, generators, and we're just switching. And you label them 1 through N, and if they're next to each other, say like 1 is next to 2, the co-cycle comes out with negative 1. Otherwise, the co-cycle comes out with 0. And so when you apply an automorphism to this, this changes where the points are and how they interact with each other. And, and we studied which automorphisms you could apply to that. The only automorphism that ends up working is flipping them across the line. So one would correspond to n, uh, two would correspond to n minus one all the way down the line. And uh, with dn, we had a similar thing occurring. And, uh, and this has already been known. This was the work that uh, motivated my research. I wanted to find a more general approach to see when these uh, specific uh, properties arose with lattices. And I played a lot of 2048 as well. Uh, so what did I actually do? Um, I generalized type DN and type AN lattices into what we called AN and AN like and DA, A like and D like behavior. So what I tried to do is I said, okay, we have these Dinkin diagrams. Do you want to use the chart? Okay. So we had <coughs> we had these A-type uh, lattices, which just uh, this diagram just tells you how the generators interact. Um, one and two share a uh, are connected, and so what we're saying is that their co-cycle is going to equal um, negative one when they interact. And uh, two and three are connected, so they're going to uh, have, give you negative one. One and three are not connected, they're not going to give you negative one, they're going to give you zero. Uh, and so if we apply an automorphism to this, it changes where the uh, 
the generators fall and which ones they're interacting with. Um, but in order for it to be an isometry, we have to do this very selectively, and we can only do certain. Uh, we can only do certain automorphisms. Uh, so the only one that works for this is switching them across here and across here, across here, yada yada yada. For a type DN, it's a similar lattice, except at the end we break off into two points. And so we need it to be a symmetrical automorphism. The only thing you're going to find working is switching it like this. And so everything gets sent to itself except for these last two points. And the very cool thing about this is that when you apply the isometry, um, you get the same thing back for DN and you get it flipped for this one. So the co-cycle for the uh, for the A-type was like this. And for the D-like, it was, it made it stay the same. So here they just switch spots, here they uh, retain the same spot. And that was a very interesting thing to come up. We wanted to see when that happened in general. And what I demonstrated was that um, what actually happened with these lattices wasn't simply because of how they were drawn out, how the connections were, in which this is, has two, is that something special that's going to give you like It has a lot more to do with the labeling, because the co-cycles only occur when uh, this is less than this one. So we had a special uh, characterization like that. And so if you change the labeling of this graph, you don't call this generator 1, you call it generator n, and you call this generator 2, it would change how these things interacted. And, it, and you'd lose your uh, the special characteristics, which we call A-like and D-like. Uh, and then I also disappointed Chris. But he's not here, so I don't feel too bad about it. Uh, what did our science pay me for? Food, caffeine, and gasoline. And if you have any questions, this is the time. <laughs> yes? Um, could you go back to a, a couple slides where you talk about the, um, 